This episode contains material that might be triggering for some. If you need to stop the podcast at any time to take care of yourself, please do so. If you need support, you can call the 24-7 National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-8255. Dialectical Behavior Therapy was created in the 1980s by Marsha Linehan in Seattle, Washington. Today, DBT is taught all over the world. We're two therapists who believe everyone can benefit from DBT skills. I'm Kate. I'm Michelle. And, and this, this is, is DBT and me. Hi, everyone. Hello. And we have Q&A 35 for you guys. 35? Man, do you 35. remember when there used to be, like, gaps between us getting enough material to yeah, do we'd have to wait. a Q&A? We had to wait. Uh-huh. <laughs> Not anymore. Those oh, days are gone. lol. Now we have so much because you guys so are much. great. You guys are wonderful, and we have a backlog, and so we occasionally, I think, just sprinkle in the apologies on that. Log. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All but, right, get us started, Kate. Yeah, I'm first. All right. This one says, "Hey y'all, I'm hella dissociated. I have my own exams coming up, and I'm tutoring eight to ten hours a day, so I am pretty stressed out right now." I have tried taking a cold shower, I've done yoga, I've done a breathwork session. What else can I try? I'm just trying to be present again. Oh, yeah. My heart went out to this listener because at various points in my life, it feels like, I don't know, maybe once every couple months, I just feel like I go through a stage in life where it's like, I just have so much on my plate (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) that it's hard to function sometimes. Um, The main thing, though, that I recommend here is use please. Use in all caps and with three exclamation marks. (laughs) Yes, that's what I wrote in my notes. Yes, please in all caps with three exclamation points. Like, please is going to be so important for you right now. Please is your friend. And I hear that when you say, like, that you did yoga. That could be in line with please. But your sleep, eating, these are going to be really, really important. Um, So really trying to prioritize that over trying to maybe, I'll speak for myself. I can fall into this. (laughs) Instead of like trying to schedule more things, even if those Mm -hmm. things are good for you, like doing a breathwork session. Great. Um, also you might need that hour to sleep, (laughs) like kind of a thing, you know? Um, so just something to think about, do less, not more, really focus on please. Um, the other thing that like this has kind of helped me when I found myself in situations like this is there's a light at the end of the tunnel here, right? It's like you say, you have your own exams coming up. The exams will come, the exams will go. (laughs) <laughs> and then hopefully life will die down a little exams bit. Exams will come, exams will go. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> hopefully things will get a little less stressful after that. So like you have this light at the end of the tunnel. Um, I will sometimes catch myself internally beating myself up during really busy periods of my life because I'm like, I'm not making time to do mm. my self-care things. Right? I'm just literally like waking up, going to work, coming home, like, (laughs) you know, doing this. And then I'm going to bed and that's it. And like, I'm failing. Like, I should be able to, right? I should on myself. I should be able to make time to do more things to take care of myself. But like, there's just periods in life where like, I don't know. (laughs) It's it's not necessarily about um, relaxation. It's not necessarily a time to try to, I don't know, be social with friends or that kind of thing. Like those times will hopefully come and let's, 
you know, really reassess <laughs> things if there's not a light at the end of the tunnel there. <laughs> but now might not be that time. Now is a time where you're putting your head down, you're doing a lot of work, and there's not much space for anything else. And you can either accept that, that like you're kind of in survival mode for maybe, I, I would hope only another couple more weeks. Um, fingers crossed. <laughs> fingers crossed. <laughs> um, and then life will shift and then you'll have more time. Or you can be trying to force yourself to do all of the things <laughs> and trying to do all of the things when you're as busy as you are is actually probably going to backfire. So just focus on please. <laughs> That's what I recommend. <laughs> I like it. Um, so just, I love everything that Michelle said. I just really wanted to speak just explicitly to the trying to be present again and the two things mm. that i think about which aren't entirely dissimilar from each other but are mindfulness specifically in the form of body scans right it's hard to be absent from your body when you're concentrating on what your feet are feeling right like that sort of pulls you down through your whole body all the way to the bottom and it can really help with being present um not that the rest of the body isn't important but Often feeling our feet is a good place to start for really getting, coming home and being in our bodies again and not so dissociated. Uh, and then four times when you, I don't know, you're so busy, I sort of get the feeling that maybe setting aside a half an hour to do a body scan meditation might not be chief among your concerns. I like to just have clients say, I exist below the neck. Mm -hmm. Just say that to themselves. You'd be surprised. I was surprised. <laughs> this was something that came from my experience that then I passed on to my clients, right? Like just saying that maybe out loud, if no one's around, maybe just in your own head, just, I exist below the neck. It's sometimes a wake up call, a real like, oh shit, what the fuck is going on down there? I have this whole thing. This whole thing is attached to me. Uh, right? <laughs> like, cause we can get in this really, I don't know, head in a jar kind of mentality sometimes. And I think that that both aids and is aided by dissociation. And so just a gentle reminder, just that simple saying to myself or to yourself, I exist below the neck can help remind you that you're an entire being. You're not a head in a jar. You're an embodied creature. Um, and I think that could be a sort of shortcut for, you know, assuming you don't have a huge amount of time to give to things like body scans. So those are my two thoughts. Yeah, I like it a lot. I'm probably going to use that one. <laughs> just below the next. I need that reminder for right? sure. <laughs> we just stop. We're like, boop, boop, boo. I'm just a brain. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. It makes me walk differently. That's funny. You'll have to tell me if it does that too. Like as soon as I think that I'm like, oh, and then like I can feel my gait change because I'm actually paying attention to how my walking feels in my body and wow. I'm more responsive to it. Yeah, it's pretty funny. I yeah. love that. That's great. <laughs> okay. Uh, so this next one is a bit on the longer side with what we have today. Um, so this listener says, I have BPD, high anxiety, depression, suicide stuff, PTSD, and this thing called FND, functional neurological disorder, which basically means I shake and wobble, have trouble walking and talking at times, and have constant tremors and shakes, all exacerbated by my high anxiety. Mm -hmm. This mostly came about by having a complete mental breakdown just over 12 months ago. I'm trying to put my life back together now and have really benefited from DBT group therapy. It has been a lifesaver. This may be simple. It may not be. But wondering what the heck make lemonade out of lemons means. It makes no sense to me. <laughs> I know. I laughed too in reading it because I was like, yep. I, th I think a lot of people can relate. Uh, they continue. Also, now this one is complicated. The concepts of strategies for increasing the probabilities of behaviors you want and strategies for decreasing or stopping unwanted behaviors and how this applies to people in our lives, our relationships, etc. 
It talks about consequences and punishments, which has a real negative vibe. I totally get it when applied to oneself, but the big question or confusing part to me is that it seems to contradict the DBT idea of the sphere of influence in the sense that we are taught through DBT that we can only control ourselves and our reactions, not other people and what they do or say. We can try and influence them, but often that doesn't work and we have to radically accept that they aren't gonna change. So then I have this horrible attachment in my mind to all of this, that changing or trying to change other people is manipulation and has some narcissistic vibe of manipulating someone to get what you want, especially when the book mentions punishment and consequences. Now, I also get that this can be situational in the sense that you have boundaries and consequences with, say, your own kids if they break the rules, i.e. no dessert, no Nintendo, being grounded or whatever. But what does this mean in, say, adult relationships like husband and wife or work colleagues or family and friends? Now, I totally get that I may have completely missed the point and I'm looking at it all the wrong way. So is there any way you can explain how any of this makes sense? Because to me, the two DBT concepts are at odds with each other. <laughs> then they say, overthinking is my superpower, <laughs> hence the need for DBT. So I'm sure I'm overcomplicating this, but I thought, heck, may as well ask the question. <laughs> yeah, may as well. Um, yeah. I will say that uh, Michelle is going to get to the bulk of that, which is the questions about the punishment, consequences, etc., which I'll admit is the more complicated side of the question that this person asks. But uh, when we were discussing this, uh, I was like, you know, Michelle, I think I'm going to take the what does make lemonades. When life gives you lemons, make you lem make lemonade, right? That's the phrase uh, that we always say, because I think that uh, my personality is slightly less lemonade <laughs> than, than Michelle's is. So I thought I might be able to help this person uh, understand it from a perspective in that regard. So I think what's meant by it, the way most people are trying, the, the idea that people are trying to get across is sort of look for the silver lining, make the most out of any situation, um, which can be very helpful. I just find it's only helpful either when I say it to myself or maybe a few trusted people. Most people tell me that sort of thing. I just want to punch them. Uh, screw you. Don't tell me to find something happy in my miserable situation. Go F yourself. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I, I get the meaning and I think, in fact, I don't know, the, yeah, the M in improve, the meaning making part of it is actually one of my favorite pieces of dbt in its own way because i think it's it can be incredibly powerful um and i i that's the way that i connect to the lemonade and lemons concept for myself it's more as this concept of what can i find what meaning can i find from this experience right which for me is generally the good that i take out of a bad situation um the situation that i i normally use for myself when I'm explaining the meaning part of improve is my childhood abuse, I think has done a lot to help me be a good therapist. The childhood abuse wasn't any better because of that. <laughs> like, yeah. It's still awful. And what's a good thing that I can make quote unquote from that situation. Uh, so what's my lemonade? My lemonade is that it has helped me be a better therapist. The lemons was the childhood abuse that I didn't have any choices about. Um, so, with the warning that it can come across as, and I think, uh, Michelle, you mentioned this term and it's perfect, rather Pollyanna-ish of, you know, find the silver lining, always good in the situation. Ugh. Um, <laughs> I think if applied internally, um, it can actually be an incredibly powerful concept, um, in a kitschy little phrase. So... That's my thoughts on that. You now get to describe behaviorism. So have fun, Michelle. <laughs> yeah, I did. And I did. I basically, you know, I responded to this listener's email and I said to this listener directly what I'm about to say out loud here in the Q&A. Luckily, the listener wrote back and was like, oh, okay, cool. That's helpful. That makes sense. And I'm like, yay. Okay, good. Um, because, oh gosh, and I don't want to speak for you, Kate, but I feel pretty confident in saying that both of us 
would not disagree with what this listener is saying about, like, the terms don't feel great. No, they really don't. You know, punishment and extinction and consequences and... <laughs> right, punishment especially sounds so... I don't know, I was actually yeah. going to say almost patriarchal, right? But icky and controlling and, mm -hmm. like, power exchange in a weird way. Yes, it totally comes across that way. So, here's the thing. DBT added in this whole section, which I don't remember which episode it is, but yes, I mean, the listener who wrote in named it of, like, the strategies for, like, increasing or decreasing the behaviors that you want. Which is funny, because they just renamed... Anyway, whatever. Yeah. If this was, this information, to my knowledge, when I think back to the first DBT manual that yeah. was published in, like, 92 or 93, this stuff was not in there. No. It was added in in the second edition, which is which was um, published in 2015. That's the one that Kate and I use, that a lot of DBT therapists use. So, you know, we were like, oh, this is a new edition here. <laughs> then now we're talking about this stuff. But the concepts themselves have been around. I mean, this was in some ways the beginning of the whole field of psychology. Like Pavlov and his dogs. Mm. And how he would train them to salivate when they heard a bell. <laughs> um, old shit. Old, old shit is where these terms came from. So these terms have been around for a very long time in the world of behaviorism and that school of thought within psychology. Why DBT chose to include this stuff in the manual, I mean, I, I see benefit to it, but I mean, I, I'm not a Marshall and Hans head. I don't know. No. <laughs> I don't know exactly. <laughs> but this is me taking a stab at it. And this is trying to bring together, I mean, what this listener really pointed out, I mean, they're not wrong when they're like, how do you hold space for both these things? Where it's like, you know, um, how can I positively or negatively reinforce this person's behavior? But also, I am kind of told by DBT to accept that I can't control or change this person. Like, what, what does it look like to marry both those things? Mm -hmm. This is my take, is that what we do, like, well, how do I want to explain this? We are all part of systems. Um, I may have touched on this a little bit before. Um, when Kate and I podcast, mm. we are a system. We're a two-person system right now as we podcast here. Um, so everyone belongs to systems of various kinds. Your family is a system. Your workplace is a system. Your romantic relationships, those are systems. Uh, <laughs> your relationships with your children. Anyways, you, you exist in relationship with other people in a lot of ways. So I don't know if Kate were to all of a sudden, I don't know, I'm just thinking of something totally <laughs> random, like stand up in this moment and hurt herself in table. some oh. way. <laughs> what did you say? I said, flip the table. <laughs> sure, that too. I don't want to think about you getting hurt. I don't know why that came into my head. Um, <laughs> I know you did accidentally hurt yourself yesterday. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> um, but would that impact podcasting and what I do next? A hundred percent. I would have a reaction to what Kate just did if she did flip the table or if she fell down or got hurt. It would affect our system. And vice versa, right? If I were to do something outlandish or crazy, <laughs> Kate would probably have a reaction. This is how it works. We are influenced by the people around us in some way. So, given that... I think what can be helpful about the information with the behavioral ideas is that it gives us a framework to notice how what we do might inadvertently be influencing the people around us. We might not know it. We might not realize, oh, I can totally see how when I do this thing, it's then kind of contributing to this behavior in the other 
person sort of a thing. I love like, how you wrote it in your notes, by the way, just by it's having things all over the place. I think you did it perfectly in your notes. Yeah, I, I was actually about to read it verbatim because it was the best way I could think of to put it of like, <laughs> this is what I wrote. Um, it could be helpful for us to see how when we do thing X, then someone does thing Y. And we can either get angry at them for doing thing Y, or we can try to change thing X within ourselves and see what happens. Um, and Kate, you are better at these terms than I am. So please correct me if I <laughs> accidentally use the wrong term. Okay. Let's say that you live with a roommate and you um, are cleaning the house on a regular basis while simultaneously complaining about how your roommate doesn't ever clean guess what? They don't have to because you're doing it. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that, that's one way to think about it. So what would that be? Negative right? punishment. Negative punishment or negative reinforcement? Oh, sorry. The doing it? I was sorry. I skipped ahead to you stopping doing it for them. Sorry. That was my brain. Apparently that's where oh, okay. I thought we were going. You doing it for them would be, you know, that's positive reinforcement of their behavior. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So by me doing it, they don't ever have to. And so if I'm in this position where I'm like, gosh, I really wish my roommate would clean the house because I'm doing it all the time. Well, let's see what happens. And you might bring in some other DBT stuff, right? Bring in some dear man here or something. Um, but what happens if I go to them and say, hey, this is what I'd really like. And then I change my behavior so that they're not getting the benefit from what I've been doing all along. Huh. Let's just see. Let's just see what happens. <laughs> because again, that's a system. So when you change your piece of it, there's going to be some kind of ripple effect. There just is. Mm -hmm. um, it's a system, like you said. I like that. It's yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So I really view it as like all of those terms are really about how can you notice what your role is in the system and what you can do to try to change your role that might affect larger change. I do think it's really important to not get super attached to the outcome, um, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like, because all you can do is be like, all right, I've asked my roommates to start cleaning more. I told them that, like, <laughs> I would like them to clean the bathroom. So I'm not cleaning the bathroom anymore. They agreed to it. Okay. <laughs> and, you know, maybe your roommate will do a great job of starting to clean the bathroom or maybe, you know, a month will go by and it will get disgusting. You're not in control of that. <laughs> um, but you can maybe at least feel good that you're trying to affect some kind of change. So that's how I think about that stuff. That's the value that I see in it. But yes, I completely agree that the terms suck. <laughs> but oh, they're yeah. not DBT terms. They are really, yeah outdated behavioral terms <laughs> right it's like i don't know maybe they're not allowed to talk about them without changing the wording because i would have i mean there's gosh uh, so i will i will own a little bit that the reason michelle says that i'm better about these terms than she is, you had it like drilled into you in grad sweet school. jesus um yeah i had a uh, my abnormal psych teacher when i was actually getting my prereqs for going to grad school put you had to write an example of all four things so positive punishment, negative punishment, positive reinforcement, and negative reinforcement. You had to write an example that illustrated each one of those on every single test until every single person in the class got them all right. <sighs> it took, that took a while, a long, <laughs> long while before everyone got them right. So I probably had to do five or six tests that included these. And every time that somebody missed it, he would explain them again. <laughs> so yes, uh, I am both grateful and traumatized yeah. <laughs> by that teacher. But I'll tell you what, I fucking know what those terms mean. Amen. Um, all right. This third one, not last one. Yep. Third one. Okay. This one says, Hi, Kate and Michelle. I just want to start off by saying that I love your podcasts. I really like the couch and the chair because you are both so open sharing your experiences. I could listen to you guys talk for hours. I've been seeing my therapist. I know it is. This is making me all warm and fuzzy feeling. 
<laughs> I have been seeing my therapist for six years. She has been incredibly patient with me as I struggle to open up to her. I have depression and anxiety along with some trust issues. After years of her encouraging me to try medication, I gave in and talked to my doctor. I've been on medication for nine months and I don't feel much better. I have increased the dose a few times, but that never seems to help. I'm terrified to try a new medication, even though I know it could help. At this point, I'm considering stopping my meds altogether, even though I know stopping abruptly will cause unpleasant side effects. I have talked about this with my therapist, and last session, she thought I had stopped them because of how miserable I am. I desperately want to get better, but fear the healing process. It's gotten to the point where I'm self-harming again, and I'm fantasizing about death. I feel lost and miserable, and I don't know what to do. I've tried talking with my parents, but they don't understand mental illness. I come from a family where we don't talk about our feelings and everything is swept under the rug. My dad and sister don't even know I'm taking medication. On top of everything, all of my friends are back in college and my sister just moved into her dorm for the first time. I'm feeling more lonely than ever. Sorry this was so long, but thank you for taking the time to read it. Any advice would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, no need to apologize for, for the link. That's all it's all helpful information. Um, honestly, the thing that stood out to me the most in this, and there's there's a lot here to to look at, but the person says, "I desperately want to get better, but fear the healing process." And whenever I hear people say this, almost always my first question that comes to mind is, "What does better mean?" Because that's going to vary from person to person. What does better mean? Um, and don't get me wrong. <laughs> these days are long behind both Kate and I now. And I <laughs> did not like it when we had to do this. Oh, Lord. But when we worked in community mental health, every client had to have a treatment plan. Yep. Now, this is not uncommon um, in therapy. And, and honestly, I think treatment plans can be very good. Um. We had to have treatment plans because this is how the insurance company would make the decision of whether this person basically kind of, you know, warranted needing Ugh. therapy. And all the treatment plan goals had to be measurable mm -hmm. and use certain language. And it was very tedious and very rigid and restrictive. And I didn't like that piece of it. But here at the heart of it is what was good back when Kate and I had to write treatment plans all the time. <laughs> um, it kind of was meant to give this clear idea of what better meant for each client. So for some clients, like some of our like really chronically mm. mentally ill clients, better looked like I'm going to take a shower every day. Um, for other clients, it looked like I'm going to exercise once a week. For some clients, it looked like I'm going to refrain from self-harm for the next six months. Um, it always had to have like a number in there. <laughs> um, but it, it kind of got at this idea of what better meant. Um, I'm not saying you have to necessarily come up with something that concise listener but you know you mentioned being on this medication for nine months and you say i don't feel much better mm -hmm. and again i kind of wonder what was the experience that you were hoping for when you started the medication like for example let's say when you're depressed what that looks like for you is that you're waking up four or five times a night this mm -hmm. can happen Mm -hmm. I mean, depression can either make people sleep a ton or not at all. Um, so let's say you're having really disrupted sleep. So maybe what better looks like is I want to only be waking up maybe once a night. Well, hey, that's clear. Okay, we got a goal there. Um, maybe you completely lose your appetite when you're depressed and better would look like I want to eat at least twice a day. Oh, hey, that's that's an idea of what better looks like. So maybe you already know this answer clearly for yourself, but if, you know, I think sometimes we just say that. We're like, I just want to feel better. And what we kind of mean by that is I don't want to feel so shitty. Um, we, 
we need to get a better idea of what that really means. <laughs> I'm sorry. Bless <laughs> <Yes>, you. <laughs> um, so I would encourage you to maybe talk about that with your therapist because I don't view it as the goal of medication or the goal of therapy is so that we never feel depressed again. Right? Like, I, I don't view that as a goal. Mm -hmm. I think that's unrealistic. <laughs> I think it's figuring out, you know, um, what specific things are you trying to reduce when it comes to the experience of depression that you currently have? What are the positive things in your life that you're trying to increase or do better with? Um, so just making sure that you're setting realistic goals for yourself with your mental health, I think is really important. Um, along with that, with setting realistic goals, I highly recommend making sure that you are doing a pleasant event or using self soothe at least once a day. Uh, even when you may not feel like it, and those days will come where you really don't, excuse me, <laughs> now I'm burping, you're sneezing. Yeah, um, <laughs> Just, you know, you may not feel like it every day. And you get to pick whatever those things are. I don't know what those things would be for you. Um, but picking something and doing it every day. I would recommend even, like, making a, making a list with your therapist of, like, kind of a menu of things you can pick from. Things that generally you tend to feel good doing. Things that bring you joy whatever it may be and then every day you look at that list and you pick something from it um because again i would view that as being in line with doing better if you are doing something each day that generally tends to be an enjoyable experience for you or one that brings benefit to your life even if some days you are forcing yourself to do it and you're not actually <laughs> i don't know you're feeling really blah the whole time Go through the motions anyways. It's better than not going through the motions. So that's something I would recommend. Yeah. I like it. Um, <laughs> it's funny. There was so much in this that I was like, all right, you have to pick some things to say, Kate. Um, <laughs> so first and foremost, I just want to say, oh, that's actually an interesting question. I don't know if you've ever been on mental health meds. I don't think you have. Have you, Michelle? I have not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I have been uh, a few times in life. Um, it's never quite been like med changes, so I, I want to own that I haven't had that exact experience, but I've had meds that didn't help and in fact made things worse, um, which that experience did convince me not to try meds again for quite a while. Uh, so I absolutely understand the kind of fear and trepidation and uncertainty that can surround medication and medication changes. So I just want to start off with a giant dose of validation about that. I also want to say you have every right to stop your medication, but please stop smartly. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned unpleasant side effects. Yep. Uh, so remember that medication that I was talking about that fucked me up? <laughs> I stopped that one cold turkey. That was not a wise decision. Um, those, uh, those withdrawals were not joking. Um, it was, it was truly, um, mind-bogglingly bad. Uh, so, you know, everybody has the right to decide whether they want to or do not want to be on medications, and I would never try and tell you what to do in that regard, except... <laughs> If you're making changes, make them smartly. Uh, if you're getting off of the medication, talk to your doctor about how a step-down program ought to look for the specific medication that you're on. Sometimes, some medications you might go through withdrawals anyway, right? So you def, some, some medications are dangerous, outright dangerous yeah. to stop cold turkey, right? So super supportive of whatever decision you want to make, but do it supported. Um, and not just sort of impulsively and uh, without support, because that can go real, real, real bad. Um, so that's that's thing one. Uh, thing two is I often think that being 
well-informed is surprisingly helpful. You know, a lot of people will just be like, try a different medication. And you're like, well, why? <laughs> and a lot of medical personnel, either because they think someone doesn't want to know, or maybe they don't think someone would understand, or I don't actually, I'm, I'm not a mind reader, I don't fucking know their motivations, um, don't really inform us as to why they think medication A might help us when medication B isn't. Mm. And especially if they're in the same class of medications. Like, here, get off of this SSRI and get onto this SSRI. You're like, well, buh. Well, mm -hmm. well why? <laughs> they are, like, legit shooting in the dark. Which is That's scary. also true. Um, yeah, because I feel like that anyways when I hear about different med things with yeah. clients. I'm like, what? <laughs> yep. So I would talk to whoever is prescribing for you right now and ask them if they have a reason for why they think a different thing might work for you better. Um, you might find that you have a different feeling or emotional response to or thoughts about the situation if you're more well-informed, right? Everything from, well, I don't have a good reason other than there are people who this medication doesn't work well for and then this one does. Because uh, human brains are weird and different and uh, otherwise we would only have one antidepressant. <laughs> That's true. Um, Right, so everything from we're shooting in the dark to maybe there's a very real, like, oh, this is an SSRI and this one is an MAOI. They're entirely different. There's good reason to uh, suspect they'll impact your brain differently. Right? So I would ask for an actual explanation, even if you aren't changing meds right away, just hear what they would recommend and why. Um, that might be a really helpful conversation to have. I also wondered, because doctor is an awfully broad term, um, I wondered if you were seeing someone who is who specializes in psychiatric medications. Um, bless general practitioners' hearts. They aren't always the best informed in that arena. Um, I don't even know what country this human being is in. I, so I, don't, I don't even know what that might look like wherever you are in the world, person. But when people are feeling uncertain about meds or are having bad reactions to meds or ambivalent about changing meds like most of the stuff that can happen if it's not just a yep the first medication i ever got on worked perfectly and i stayed on it forever amen um i do highly recommend trying to find a prescriber who specializes in psychiatric medications um First of all, because they know more, and second of all, because that, uh, you know, explaining things to you thing, they have a better chance of being able to do that as well. Mm -hmm. So, now I have talked my freaking mouth off about the medication stuff. I hope some of it there was helpful. Um, I do also just want to validate that, I don't know, uh, here, I will own my projection. It seemed like the person was real down on themselves. Yeah. Uh about their own mental health issues, about how poorly they're doing. And I just wanted to say that from the tiny little glimpse that you gave me about your life and your family, I suspect you have more than enough external factors as well that are contributing to your lack of wellness. Um, so own your shit and try not to own shit that isn't yours. Um, because the family we were raised by, the family we are living in, like all of these things, you know, how isolated we are or are not, right? These play a huge role in how well anybody does, let alone someone who's already working from a baseline of mental illness. You know, takes one to know one. So I hear you, I see you, be nice to you, God damn it. Um, <laughs> Uh, and then because I try whenever possible, I feel compelled uh, to throw in a TPT skill. Um, I actually, I don't know, for fighting a lot of what this person mentions with depression and lethargy and a lack of enjoyment with things and just blah, the general blahness of high anxiety and depression. I'm a big fan of Build Mastery from uh, the ABCs. I know Michelle was talking about the pleasant events part of that. Mm -hmm. Um it's feels really good both to do something we're already good at, which can be one form, I think, of it's not quite how they talk about it, but I think it counts as building mastery, is engaging in something where we already feel competent and like, yeah, look at me, I'm good at this thing. Also really fun to get good 
at something. Anything, really. Um, everything, you know, learn a new language, pick up a new culinary skill, uh, right? Learn gardening, uh, learn about keeping bees. I don't know. <laughs> Cheese making. I don't know. I can't help it. My own interests leak out. Anytime I try and make a random list of stuff, it's not random. Uh, <laughs> Uh, nope, see, I'm like, books! See, I can't get out of the side of my own head. But, um, when, it, you know, depression tends to wound us in our self-worth. And building mastery can do a surprising amount to heal that. So, there you go. I feel like I was actually long-winded for once. <laughs> I love it. It's great. <laughs> Alright, now, okay. now we're on the last one, yeah? Now we're on the last one. Um, okay. Yeah, here we go. So this one says, Hi, Kate and Michelle. I only just found your podcast and it's really helping. I had a question about the skills I should be using. I went to a DBT-based therapy session here in the UK, but I found it extremely unsupportive and had multiple sessions where two others in the group started to have a go at me. I tried to stay in the group but felt that the counselors provided me with no support. It got to the point that I didn't feel safe to express my thoughts or opinions. Um, we also edited this one a little bit. They gave some examples of what happened in the group, but we, but we cut that part out. Uh, continuing, they say, I have since been reading through Marsha Linehan's book on DBT and came across your podcast. I'm struggling quite a lot at the moment. My husband and I are getting to a point where we would like to try for a child, and so I have come off of my antidepressants. Since then, I've been feeling extremely miserable with my job. It's not something I would say is specifically due to the antidepressants, as I move jobs every year or two normally due to getting bored and feeling trapped. As we have decided I will be the part-time stay-at-home parent when we do have a kid, I'm in a position where I can't use my normal method of jumping ship and finding a new job because... I need to be in a job that provides opportunities for part-time work and decent maternity pay. The fact that I'm now trapped in this position is destroying me mentally, and I feel like every day there is no reason to wake up. I have so many hobbies but feel I can't enjoy them because I have so many, in all caps, and no time to do them all. So I start to stress about which ones I have time for and which ones I can no longer do. I've tried radical acceptance, but it doesn't change my emotions, and I'm not very good at it. What would you suggest? And then they say, sorry for the essay. Thanks again for your podcast and all that you do. Oh, that sounds tough. Um, uh, once again, I find that a lot of the things that I want to say uh, aren't DBT related. Um, <laughs> but this uh, listener talks so much about the sense of being trapped. Um, at least that's one of the main things that stood out to me. And so I wanted to offer up a change in perspective that has helped a lot of my clients when they are in situations that feel like, yeah, like a trap or something similar to that, which is, how do I want to phrase this? I'm normally doing this with people who I work with all the time. The <laughs> is you don't actually have to. You don't have to. You don't have to stay. You don't have to be in that kind of job. You don't You don't have to do any of it. Now, it's maybe the best possible plan <laughs> for the things that you want to accomplish. It may be, in fact, the only way you can accomplish some other things that you would like to accomplish. Perhaps, say, having a child. Um, but you don't have to, right? As soon as we start saying things like we have to or that we're trapped, right? That we don't have any choices. Ooh, boy, is that heavy and hard. That's a recipe right? for unhappiness. <laughs> right? So much so, right? And it, and it's, and it's a position of powerlessness. And I have yet to meet the human being who enjoys feeling powerless, especially in a situation where they're unhappy. So much though I understand where you're coming from and I certainly don't have, or I certainly do have a glass house here. I, you know, I don't think I'm ever free from entirely from the mistakes I talk about other people making, but you might feel a lot better if you own your choice as a choice, because it is a choice. You don't actually, literally, have to do these things. You don't. You're choosing to have a child, 
And so because of that, you are choosing to get off the antidepressants and you've chosen to stay in this job because you see it as giving you the best opportunity to have the best start at your child's early life. Hard choices, maybe choices where you don't see better ones, maybe the best of bad choices, but choices. These are things you've decided to do. And in recognizing that decision, in recognizing the choice that you made, I think you have a much, I think it brings you back into your power. You are being a powerful, badass motherfucking you by choosing to do these incredibly difficult things in order to obtain this huge life goal. You're choosing to make these sacrifices because it serves your ultimate ends, right? These are places of power. These are places of, <sighs> I want another word, but I can't find one. Uh, <laughs> right? You're not, you're not a victim in those scenarios. You are, you are, you are the choice maker, not the trapped. So that's the first and number one thing that I would recommend. Uh, just because I really honed in on that trapped bit. Um, of what you were saying. Uh, the other thing is I also understand this idea of many hobbies. I think, Michelle, you'll talk about it too, but I think we have a slightly different yep. way of coming at it. Um, yeah, we probably do. I think of my hobbies as, I don't know, eliciting different feelings in me or serving different purposes for me, right? Um, reading or, you know, coloring or things like that. That's a real relaxation kind of hobby. Right? That's chill, that's downtime, that's recuperative in a kind of way. Um, then I have things more like gardening, which I'm often using my body pretty hard. I can in no way, shape, or form call that restful. <laughs> but I feel uh, things like playing with my indoor plants or doing gardening, I feel really empowered. Like, aha! I am the goddess of green things! Look at what I have brought! Right? Like, so I, I don't know, I feel very in touch with nature, with is very nurturing for me in a way. Um, cooking or baking really, to me, excites my creative part of myself. And so I feel like I'm like really feeding that part of me with that. And so I wonder, as someone who has so many hobbies, as you say, maybe you could start to look at what each of them does for you. What's different between them? Which ones help you relax? Which ones help enliven you? Which ones, you know, nurture, maybe if you have a boring and mundane job, what's something that feels exciting? Um, or creative for you, right? And so maybe if you look at the different aspects of your different hobbies, it might help you make choices rather than stressing about doing them all. Because I don't know, for instance, if I want to go to sleep, drinking a bunch of caffeine is probably not the thing that's going to help me. I really love a lot of very caffeinated beverages, but I don't have to feel stressed about not choosing them because they're just clearly the wrong thing for that situation. A um, little oversimplified, but um, I do think you might be able to find something like that. All right, for this situation, this hobby of mine is going to feed me, in quotes, the best. Um, and then to try and get to uh, skill-wise, I do think being mindful um, could help you. You do seem to be past and future tripping in a sense. Um, so mindfulness can help to anchor you to the present. Um, also mindfulness, one of the key tenets is to not cling to anything or push anything away. And though I understand you're writing us because you're having issues. So of course you're going to focus more in the thing you're writing on the issues. <laughs> I also know that when I'm cripplingly depressed and don't feel like getting up. Not don't feel like getting up. Um, maybe I'm even sad to wake up in the mornings. My focus tends to be on the shit. Um, right? Just all the things that confirm why waking up is bad. Right? All of the situational aspects, all of my internal aspects. I got real focused on the negative, on the hard, on the painful parts of my life for that time. So mindfulness and mindfulness, maybe specifically of things that you have to be grateful for. I will admit, I think we as a culture have leaned a little, I'm going to say it too far into gratitude, a little bit of toxic positivity and it drives mm. me more than a little fucking bonkers. Um, 
But despite it being trendy and despite it being overused, in my opinion, there really is space for what gratitude can bring into a life. Because I'm betting there's stuff in there in your life that's still good and that's still worth being grateful for. Um, and just remembering to include that in the mix can often help to lighten the load. Right. I also feel like I talked a lot that time. Your turn. It's all good. You said good things. Um, I'm trying to think of where to begin. Because <laughs> honestly, when I read this, I was like, oh my God. Like, in a, I just relate. Um, in the mm. therapy world, we call this counter-transference. <laughs> when a client is bringing something up that really touches on things for us. Mm -hmm. Oh, listener, there's so much that I can relate to in what you said. Um, the thing, I didn't make a note of this, but I really heard it um, as I was rereading this post. Um, and I say it with love because, boy, is this at the heart of my work in therapy myself. I hear a lot of perfectionism going on here mm. and it's, and it's subtle. Like you got to read between the lines to hear it. But like starting off when it says, I have a question about the skills I should be using, right? Like I'm looking for the right answer here. Um, and then when they say, um, yeah, I have so many hobbies, but feel I can't enjoy them because I have so many and no time to do them all. You are speaking to me because <laughs> um, this is me. I, ha I have so many magazines to read. I have so many TV shows to watch. I have so many things that I just, I enjoy these things. And sometimes I take on a very perfectionistic mindset where I'm like, I'm falling behind. I'm not doing the right thing right now. Um, I hear when they say I've tried radical acceptance, but I'm not very good at it. Right. I just, I, I hear undertones of like perfectionism throughout this. And perfectionism is something that I really struggle with myself. Um, of course, another way that I can relate is I'm, I'm still currently pregnant as we <laughs> record this. <laughs> I'm almost 39 weeks. So I'm very pregnant right oh, now. But, so um, close. <laughs> so close. Any day, which is why we're <laughs> binge recording a bunch of these. <laughs> Hopefully before he comes. Um, but I totally understand how it's like the minute that you make that decision to start trying to conceive, something switches in your brain. Doesn't matter that you're not pregnant yet. Something switches in your brain. Because you could get pregnant at any time, in theory. And what I realized for myself in my pregnancy journey, and maybe this will be something for you to consider in yours, Oh my gosh, we don't have control. Um, we just don't. <laughs> uh, we talk, We Kate and I have a whole episode in the Couch in the Chair podcast um, sharing experiences with my pregnancy journey and um, Kate's experiences with abortion and fertility loss and all of that. It's actually a pretty powerful episode to listen to, but... Um, I have had to learn through my own experiences that when it comes to trying to conceive and pregnancy and just around the corner, I'm sure, motherhood, <laughs> yeah, we don't have control. Uh, that doesn't mean we're powerless, but we don't have control. And I'm wondering if that's underlying part of this unhappiness for you is because you're trying to make the best decision as perfectionists do, right? We want to pick the best thing. And sometimes nothing meets our standards. <laughs> um, so you're like, okay, like I'll stay at this job because it has these good things about it. But, you know... Uh, <laughs> I want more, I want something different, or this doesn't feel like enough, and that kind of a thing. Um, and it's true, like, when it comes to, again, try to conceive and pregnancy and all of that, like, we so badly want to do it, quote, unquote, right. Mm. We want to make the best choices for us and for that child that, you know, we may not be pregnant with yet, but hopefully will be. I mean, 
I, I just, I really, I really get it. Um, a lot of what's going on here with what this listener wrote in. So that having been said, what I'm about to suggest is all stuff that I work on <laughs> on a regular basis. Um, because I'm struggling with many of these things that this listener, um, mm -hmm. spoke about. Uh, so a lot of this comes down to letting go of, <laughs> you know, how, like there's this expression of like, quote unquote, like finding Mr. Right. Oh. And then people are like, well, I found Mr. Right, right now. now. <laughs> like that kind of a thing. All right. It's so, it's so dumb, but <laughs> honestly, Try to apply some of that thinking to yourself. This is not about, like, when you start thinking really big picture and really long term about what's going to be right or what's going to be best, oh my gosh, you are setting yourself up for a lot of stress. A lot of stress. Just focus on what feels good right now. Um, that is way easier said than done, but like I think about the dilemma you mentioned with your hobbies. Just pick something something right if you're the type of person which i'm not i cannot juggle multiple books at one time but i know many people who do and if let's say you're the kind of person who tends to have two or three books in progress at once and you're like i don't know which book to read doesn't matter just pick the one that feels best for right now um like it's kind of letting Ooh. go of this idea that there's a best choice I like that with the book thing just because I have so many books I haven't read that sometimes I can get down on myself for the fact that the book I want Me to read too. is a book I've already read. Oh. But I'm like, that's yeah. what I want right now. <laughs> yeah, that's a great example. Yep. We can get so caught up in what's left undone or what we still have to do um, that we just get really hard on ourselves. But like, just pick something for right now. That's okay. Let go of the idea that there's something that is right because there probably isn't. Um, I also can't help but touch on the radical acceptance piece. Uh, they mentioned it only very briefly at the end. I don't know exactly what's meant when they say I'm not very good at it. Hmm. Um, but, I mean, Kate, you kind of touched on this, and I heard this too, right? There's, There really is this, like, push-pull between, like, the past and the future, and I hear a lot of thinking ahead about the future. I hear a lot of that all throughout this, which again is very common when we're struggling with perfectionism because we want everything to go well. Uh, but we don't know how things are going to go. Sometimes we can try our absolute best and things may not go according to our plans. And we can't radically accept the future because it hasn't happened yet. So if that's where you're trying to use radical acceptance, if like you're trying to use radical acceptance with like, okay, so I just need to stay at this job. Okay, but we're also thinking way far ahead in the future there. Because even though I definitely hear the benefits of staying at this job, and I think you're making like a very like rational, mature, well thought out decision to stay, you're not even pregnant yet. Right? So, like, we're already thinking ahead to, like, well, when I am pregnant and when this child is born. And some of that is necessary to get us through life. Some of that just drains us when we're thinking ahead all the time and trying to make the best decision today because we're already anticipating of, like, well, this is what I'm going to need in three years. So this is what I have to do now. It doesn't always serve us. Um, so just really making sure that if you are practicing radical acceptance, you are doing it with something that's actually concretely in the here and the now, rather than trying to radically accept how you think things will be. It doesn't work so well when we try it out on stuff that isn't here yet. Um, I like that. Oh, thanks. Um, but I don't know. I have so much compassion for this listener. <laughs> I feel like I could keep going and relating and all of that, but um, I hope some of what Kate said or some of what I said is is helpful. So, yeah. all right, I guess that's it for today then. Well, yeah. today for this episode <laughs> for thirty five, <laughs> we're wrapping up thirty five. So, if yep. you would like to be included in a future Q and A, please feel free to email us dbtnmepodcast at gmail.com or 
go ahead and post in the Facebook group. We mine a lot from there for these episodes as well. So until next time. Yep. Thank you, everybody. To learn more about us and the DBT skills we're teaching each week, join our Facebook group. Simply log in to your Facebook profile and search for 